remember last time I was teaching over transaction costs and one assumption <coughs> to have <coughs> a perfect competitive system is that there is no transaction cost. Can we assume that there is no transaction cost within these five sectors? Do you think that we have transaction costs within the electricity sector? No. They just meet in the marketplace and sell. No transaction costs. Do you think we have transaction costs within the fish farming industry? No. Within the aluminium sector? No. Within the oil sector? Within the gas sector? The only way, the only uh, sector where we have a kind of transaction costs, that is the example I gave you that we negotiated in 1987 the long-term contracts for gas deliveries from Troll to Europe. That was one of, was a very big contract and that was negotiated over, I think it took three years to negotiate the contract where they finally agreed on prices and they agreed on all the details in the contract. But now, that contract are already there. <laughs> some cost, some cost. And when we sell now, these renegotiations, that is just to reduce the prices down towards the proper market price. So the transaction cost there, some cost. So I can really conclude no transaction cost of any significance. What about free entry and exit? Can you enter, can you exit? No. No problem. You can always enter the electricity market. If you will be a own an owner of just um, a potential hydro power system that can be developed. If you be the owner a farmer somewhere there that will own a river with a dam, <laughs> he'll be rich. He'll be very, very rich. Because he will develop it, enter the market, and the sh long run marginal cost will be much lower than the market price of electricity. So he will just develop. So no problem with the entry and exit. But in this stupid textbook, this US textbook, there are two assumptions that are not here. And these are for me the two most important assumptions. Can you read? Here is one, two, three, four, five. And that's okay. These five are okay enough, but I missed two. Which one? Have anybody of you heard about the climate effect? <laughs> What is that called in the textbook? 
from now on this is called external effect external effect do you know what that is that is when you produce gas or oil and when you burn that gas or oil that gas and oil will be transformed into climate gas emissions and therefore you have to assume in a perfect competitive system for the system to work you always in all assume that it's only a perfect competitive system if you will have no external effects no external effects do we have any external effects concerning hydropower think think there is external effect for example the fish they cannot go up the down and w what is the external effect then that there is a lack of uh, production for the fish and unique wilderness when you develop develop a stream and you regulate in the mountain areas you just interrupt with unique wilderness that's an external effect that's an external effect but electricity hydropower and I am very fond of salmon fishing and when you develop this electricity through hydropower you just destroy the salmon fishing system so I don't like that <laughs> as a very very um, and I enjoy salmon fishing so this is for me an important external effect but to produce hydropower has no climate effect but to produce oil and gas has a climate effect therefore the most important policy matter for the Norwegians is to come up with a price on climate emissions. We will be in the forefront to say you just have to pay for the external effect. Pay for the external effect. So our Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg has been more or less the driving force internationally to develop the price on climate gas emissions so the textbook ignore this matter in Norway this is an important reason for regulation important reason for regulation and then, finally, the most important one for me, that is not on the list here, that does not extern concern external effects, but are the most important one for me personally. Can you guess? one reason why we don't in our system like everything to be designed by perfect competitive markets because if we have the labor market that's also a market if we have the financial market that is a market what will be the main problem for a system that will be to a great extent dominated by a perfect competitive system I told you once about the most famous economist for the time being his name is Piketty Piketty Wrote, write down the name Piketty 
an assumption seven is income distribution to believe in a market the perfect market to be uh, efficient you just will have to assume that the income distribution is in accordance with a kind of political acceptable income distribution Rawls is the famous philosopher theory of justice theory of justice and we have learned in our system that this theory of justice is so important that we don't leave for the market to design the income distribution that is we don't believe that the market the perfect competitive system has any ability to design on the income distribution that is in accordance with what the Norwegians really feel that the income distribution should be in a well working economy so we don't like at all to be dominated by a perfect competitive system we don't like that and we don't at all let the perfect competitive system decide on the income distribution we just regulate that we use the market where it has properties to develop efficiency but then we regulate where we don't believe in it but this textbook doesn't discuss this because it's made in well <laughs> US yes. but in our system assumption number seven is the most important one that's what gives us motivation for regulation we don't believe in the income distribution that will come out of a system dominated by a perfect competitive system we regulate it we have a tax system and we all pay so we only see our net income and we believe that our net income is what we earn because we never see what we earn totally we only see the net income that is important and that is how we just finance our welfare state we see our net income and I'm happy with that I go to the hospital and we fig uh, they will fix me for free I return back so I can teach for you today when I'm fit for fight <laughs> as you can see and I don't see my total salary I don't I only see the net and I know for sure that in our system there is no such thing as corruption that will steal from that tax payment that I give none bureaucrats will ever be able to steal anything therefore with no corruption I pay my tax see my net salary and I'm happy with that this is a comparative advantage of the Norwegian system very high taxes to finance the welfare state and that kind of regulation is just the responsibility of the state I'm 65 within five years I'll be 70 then I will be a pensionist uh, uh. 
and my pension. You cannot dream of how high it will be. Because I've been taken care of by the state. And I've paid my taxes. And therefore, when I'm 70, I will have a very high pension. And today, I will have a very high salary. And I pay my taxes. I go to the hospital. They fix them. But this course is not the course in welfare economics. It is a course to understand complex markets. But for you to understand the difference from a US textbook, from the Norwegian textbook, you just need also to include assumption 6 and 7. That is those assumptions where the Norwegian will say that these are market failures. Where the market doesn't work, we say that we have market failures, and that's where we have room for heavy regulations. So, I return back to the nice and brilliant perfect competitive model. Let's just start to conclude that in the perfect competitive model all the firms are price takers. What's meant by that? If you put your price a little bit lower than the price you can observe out there, what happens? You will be stupid to do that because you can always sell more to the price that will be fixed out there. If you try to put your price a little bit higher because of perfect information, nobody will buy. <laughs> so you are just forced to being a price taker. And you have, for every firm, you have a perfect elastic demand curve. That's flat. And every firm will be confronted with a perfect elastic demand curve. If the price will be 20, you can sell as much as you want and earn 20. But you never will go lower because you lose. And if you go higher, you will sell nothing. That's meant by price taker perfect elastic demand curve. Right. And for the first time, I introduced price elasticity of demand. That is percentage change in Q, volume, divided by percentage change in P, equal to minus 0 0.3, means that if you increase the price with 10%, the demand will go down with 3. This is an important figure. This is a figure that you for certain will meet in the final exam. And for the first time, I introduce you on the linear demand curve. And you'll be sure that you'll meet with that one too in the final exam. The price is equal to A minus BQ. B is the slope of the linear curve. Okay? So, hmm? B? B is the slope of the linear curve. And you'll under understand that <coughs> when we now come to the figure. Next one. Finally, picture. You remember from last lecture? Firm supply curve. Remember, short run cost curves, figure 3 and 2. Move a little bit forward. 
Can I remember that? Have you seen it before? Yes. Yeah. There, you see the short run marginal cost curve. It's U shaped. There, you see the average variable cost curve. It's U shaped. And when you include the fixed cost, you have the short run average total cost curve. It's U shaped. And the red curve is the firm's supply curve. Why come? Because every company, whatever market you have, will always end up to produce exactly where marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. You remember that from last lecture? And if you maximize your profit, you always end up marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And if the price will be P2, what will be the marginal revenue when the price will be fixed? It's P2. And what will be the supply then? Q2, why? Because when P2 is exactly equal to short run marginal cost, that is where the company will maximize the profit. So if the price will be P2, the, companies will, the company will exactly sell Q2. What if the price is P1? How much will the company sell? Q1. Q1, of course. Why? They maximize their profit. And the modern revenue will be P1 equal to the modern cost gives you exactly Q1. If you go down to price P0, how much will you produce? Cost Q0, why? Price equal to marginal cost. What is meant by shutdown point? When the prices will be P0, you see that you exactly in shutdown point cover the average variable cost. What's meant by that? You don't cover anything on the fixed cost. You just cover your average variable cost. You go on producing, but the fixed cost is some cost here. You have no avoid avoidable cost. Just sunk. Fixed cost is just sunk. You cannot uh, get anything back. You don't have anything to pay for the fixed cost. When price is equal to P0, you produce Q0, and the fixed cost, you will just go to the owners and say, there will be no such thing as profit. We don't cover the fixed cost. You have to pay for it. So this is called the shutdown price. What if the price will be lower? You don't cover the average variable cost. What is P1? What happens if you end up in P1? When you think Q1? <coughs> you exactly cover the fixed cost. And the owners will be happy. And the red line from Q0 to Q1 is where you increase your profit. And finally, when you reach Q1, you cover all the fixed costs. What if you end up in P2? That red rectangle is the profit. Why come? 
you produce Q2 and you have per unit a profit equal to P2 minus AC2 and if you just multiply that with Q2 the total units you will have the red area and your owners will be happy you end up with a profit so this is for a single form elegant so every firm will act exactly according to this figure when they just take part in a perfect competitive system can you go back? The short run module cost curve is the supply curve. All the firms will be forced to move along that curve because they maximize profit. So Equilibrium figure 3.3. Three. Now it's the very elegant one. Mm. Just look at figure 3.3. Three. Mm. This is beautiful. Why come? Now we add all the company's supply curves together. And to the left hand side we have the short run firm supply curve, all the firms are supply curve, and P P1 is now for each firm the demand curve that each company will be confronted with. At the right hand side, you have the demand curve. That is the demand curve for all the customers added together and that's falling and there you have the supply curve for all the firms huh? for, all for all producers at the right hand side and then they just meet there demand and supply and the market forces we just end up with price equal to marginal cost, P1. That is where you just have Q1. And this is the beautiful market equilibrium where demand and supply will decide on the prices. Price equal to marginal cost and Q1 will be given. Isn't it beautiful? And when we move to the left hand part of this figure, you have a single firm supply curve. The price is given in the market equal to P1. And when the price will be P1, the firm will move along its supply curve, the red line. And in this case, if the price will be P1, this company, the single firm, will earn a profit equal to the red triangle. Why come? Because average total cost 1 is lower than the price P1. So per unit, you earn the difference P1 minus ATC1. That is what you earn per unit. And if you multiply that with the volume Q1, you have that red triangle. So this is a case where the owners will be happy and say that, mm, we earn a profit. The red triangle. Hallelujah. They are happy. Uh, 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 uh. You won't 
see that. Now you go back again to the text. Equilibrium, figure 3 3. That gives us economic profit in the short run. But can that exist in the long run? In the long run. Why come? If a single company in a perfect competitive system will earn a profit, there will be incentives for newcomers to enter. Then, later on, we will play the entry game. But if entry is easy, and exit is easy, there, because of entry, will be no such things as profit in the long run. So in the long run, the competition when drive every company into cost efficiency and through cost efficiency they will end up producing where the average variable cost will be as low as possible cost efficiency there will be no such things as a profit and the efficiency will be exactly where all the consumers will have whatever commodity they want equal to their marginal willingness to pay. And if their marginal willingness to pay is higher, then what will be the extra cost to produce it? they will produce more. And in the equilibrium, they will produce exactly the amount that the consumers want in exactly the most cost-efficient way. And this system is efficient because the driving forces through competition will eliminate any power. There is no such thing as power in a perfect competitive system. No power. That's why Adam Smith, when he once were able to formulate perfect competitive system, that was his philosophical idea. Through a perfect competitive system, you eliminate power. They cannot do anything else than produce cost efficient to deliver to consumers exactly what the consumers will have and the power will be in the hand of the consumers and the producers will have no power they just go on competing until there will be no profit left because of entering smart and very rational and this is the main reason for all countries to look to a perfect competitive system to help them to develop efficiency. Russia has tried to do it, not very successful. <laughs> China is trying to do it, much more successful than Russia. O and in Africa, they try to do it, and they all try to do it in the same way. Looking at this figure, the long run equilibrium, and the efficiency equilibrium, and they all have read the textbook, but that doesn't help. Why? You don't solve the, dist the distribution problem. There will be no such thing as a tax system in this. So for countries not to succeed, that is, they just start with the market system 
and they will just have to start with that. There will be no country that can develop their economy without using this market system. But it takes a long time to develop an efficient tax system that will be with no corruption. That is much more difficult than to develop, to develop a market. So they all do it in all countries. We do it in Norway. Take advantage of all the markets where it really works and regulate where we see it doesn't work. So the complex challenge is to use the market system where it has an efficiency adva uh, advantage and to use regulations to take care of external effects and income distribution. But I can just add that I think in my reflections that our system the Norwegian economy has been so very successful for two reasons. The first one has been given us from nature. <laughs> that is hydropower, oil and gas, the forest industry, minerals, fish farming, it's all related to resources. That's what we have been good at. It is resources. It's not to develop R&D within pharmaceutical industry. We don't need to produce cars. We are not good at that. We don't need to co compete with Google. We are not good at that. We are good at natural resources. Maybe we are the best in the world to develop natural resources at a very cost-efficient way dealing with competitive markets. That's the simple understanding of the Norwegian system. Our system is to develop within complex market our resource base. And within that concept I think it is a reminder every time to say that it is the workforce that have developed these resources. It is the labor force that have developed the resources. There is a very cult good culture for working hard. The workforce that have developed the oil fields offshore together with the engineers has been a success. And the troll platform is the biggest produced ever in the world. It's the highest building produced ever in the world. The troll platform. It's the highest in the world. And it is the workforce, the labor, the engineer that built it. It is enormous. Enormous. So it's always a reminder that it is the workforce, the labor, the competency that develops the resources. This is the Norwegian way. And the second, since we have had no conflict between people in Norway. We had the First World War and the Second World War, but all the Norwegians, we stick together. We developed no conflicts within Norway. And we have one minority, the Laps. Huh. The Laps. They have been given enormous privilege, enormous privilege. Why come? Because they are a minority and we can afford 
that the minorities will have very high priorities. Why? We don't want conflict. And since we don't have these conflicts, we have developed a tax system. That is our comparative advantage. We just finance the welfare state by paying taxes. These are the two main reasons for us to be successful. We have worked hard, but God gave us the natural resources for some reason. <laughs> we didn't ask for it. They were given us for some reason, but we have been very, very good to develop them. The best in the world to develop natural resources. And that's what we are going to do in the future. We are going to develop natural resources. We are not going to compete with the Swedes in producing Volvo <laughs> or pharmaceuticals or whatever. We are going to be good at developing natural resources. And those of you that will be included in the Norwegian labor market can be sure of the company you will work for will directly or indirectly be connected to developing natural resources. But you have just to be aware of that you will have to pay taxes. <laughs> so once you go into the Norwegian labor market, you don't see, you only see your net salary, and you don't have any ability to try to fix and fix with that. You just pay your taxes. But your salary, if you go into the Norwegian labor market, will be very, very high. And the competency you will have when you leave this course will be so high that all of you will start with a very high salary. Break again? 